Hey footy fans, welcome to the Point of Difference Rugby League podcast. I'm your host Dave and today I have an amazing guest on the show. We're going back in the day with the 1983 Dalian rookie and grand final winner for the Parramatta Eels. It's the one and only David Lydiard. How you going, mate? Good, Dave. Really good, bud. Really oh, good. Man. Really happy to be asked to be on your podcast, mate. It's a you're a legend and it's a bit of an it's a real honor. So thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh mate, the honor's all mine. Honestly, um, it's a privilege to speak to all you old guys who've been there, done it, and uh, you were in an amazing generation of footy players. And you know, I just love speaking to you guys, hearing the cool stories. And I'm very glad to see you. You're back on your feet after you had a bit of a health scare last year. So yeah, you yeah. Uh, well, it was actually on Christmas Eve here at, at my apartment um, in Palm Beach, and. Uh, yeah, I woke up and I usually do a 12K walk with a bloke that you guys might remember, Darrell Williams, and um, I, he wasn't up for it, so I did it on my own and I got back and I wasn't feeling too well and um, my wife cooked me some breakfast. It was on Christmas Eve and I said that I was having indigestion, so I walked around to the pharmacy and got some my land to chugged a half a bottle of that down and a couple of hours later I'm still sitting there not whinging, but um, not looking too crash hot. And my wife went, come on, I'm going to take you to the hospital. I said, I'm not going to the hospital with indigestion. She said, get in the car. So she bossed me to get in the car and I drove, she drove me to the hospital. They took me straight in and put me on an ECG and I was having a massive heart attack. And um, they put me in an ambulance with sirens blaring with a doctor in the back and um, to John Flynn Private Hospital. I've been up there on a number of other occasions for different surgeries but so yeah. um they were waiting for me i had three blocked arteries one was 100 percent blocked and the other two were 80 percent blocked so i was very lucky luckily I, w- I listened to my wife mate and um yeah. got in the car yeah very scary time wow oh well i'm i'm very uh glad to see you still in one piece mm. and, uh, you know Oh, yeah. I had a chat this morning with a bloke I played with at the Eels, Peter Wynn. You might remember him. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, Wally Pete had a had two stents in. He had a heart attack twelve months ago, and then um, I've just been made an ambassador with the Eels. And I was at the Bulldogs game with Steve Eller and Steve Edge and a guy called Terry Lamb who played. You'd remember him from the Bulldogs. And um, pretty handy player. On, <laughs> yeah, he was he was a gun and. Um, we're on stage being interviewed and Pete was supposed to come and bring his couple of mates with him and his son. And um, I walked out to start watch the game and these boys went, oh, Lids, have you heard what's happened to Pete? And I went, no. And he said, um, he had a massive heart attack last night, another one. Oh, I went, are you serious? So, yeah, he had um, he had another massive heart attack. I spoke to him today, actually, and um, he's out of yeah. hospital and recovering well. So... Um, I've been we've been very fortunate that the blokes I played with back in the 80s with the Eels and stuff, and we haven't lost anyone yet. So, um, yeah, me, me and him are pretty close to, yeah, pretty close to it. So, it's pretty, pretty scary. Like, we, you know, I'm he's a few years older than me, 66, I'm 63. So, you know, you get to this point and you start to, you know, start to hear about losing, you know, people around you, and um. But um, we're still lucky that we're above ground and uh, still yeah, going, still going okay. Yeah, it's probably a good time to ask you one of the fan questions I had for you, which was how important is it for you guys um, as a team to you know keep getting together and um, you know staying that connectivity with each other. How important is that? Look, I speak to I speak to most of the boys. We've got we've opened up a, a WhatsApp. Um, it's an Eels WhatsApp with all the guys that I, I played with in the 80s, like, you know, Kenny and Ella yeah. and Growth and all that, you know. Wow. The, I spoke to Pricey. Pricey had a golf day. Him and his wife got melanoma and he had a golf day last week and Sterlo and Fatty Vorton came. Daryl Williams played and he's, wow. um, with his group. Um, had a lot of um, other players turn up and Ray had and his wife had both melanoma cancer, the stage four, but they beat it. So he's now decided to raise money and he has a golf day every year. And uh, so it was great. But, um, you know, to Ray rang me this morning just to check on me to see how I was, how, how I'm doing. And, um, yep. you know, they're just amazing guys. I, mean, I speak to Brett Kenny, Steve Ello, Guru rang me yesterday, Eric Growth, sorry, rang me yesterday. 
And um, I'm very fortunate that they've just been, I've known these boys for 40 years now and uh, yeah. we're just like, like best mates. It's crazy. Hey, that's as long as I've been alive. That's so cool. <laughs> Obviously, there you go. on the big 4 0 this year. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, thanks, man. So, what have you been up to post footy? Like, what have you been doing with yourself? Um, look, when I started playing footy, um, I was 19. Um, I played for the Eels. I had a couple of seasons with the Panthers. I went to Manly for three years, and then I played in England for four years for hey. Oldham. Hull FC and Hull KR. Um, at the end of my career, I, I'm, a, I'm Aboriginal and um, I started doing a lot of work in communities just as a footy player, you know, going out and doing presentations and doing, you know, that sort of stuff, which was pretty yeah. cool. So I started an Aboriginal not-for-profit called NASCA, the National Aboriginal Sporting Chance Academy. That's been going for 25 years. Wow. And um, having the name in footy sort of opened the door to... Um, a guy called the Honourable John Brown, who was under Bob Hawke, who we sadly lost a couple of years ago now. Um, he helped me put together a board of patrons, where, which is, he was a John Hardigan as the CEO of News Limited. He's retired now. John Simon from Aussie Home Loans. Bill Moss, the head of Macquarie Bank. Um, Richard Longe is the chairman of Investec Bank. I had some very heavy hitters around me that helped me and Lend Lease is a big construction company over here. Or well, they're they're all you know not all over the world, but they're they're massive company, and they've been my partners for twenty five years, and um, I've wow. been very very blessed to sort of be adopted. The, the guy who got me on board was Stuart Hornery. He's passed away now, but um, you know they've been my partner for twenty five years, helping me support community. Tomorrow I'm flying out to a community called Moree. Yeah, Western New South Wales, and I'm um, spending a few days out there with community, talking about what's going on with their youth and how we can, how I can work. I've, I've got an employment company as well, which just helps young Aboriginal kids get into jobs. So, so for cool. forty years, I've sort of been giving back, trying to make a difference, and having having played footy, I'm still lucky that some people remember me. I got, I get surprised because. I've lost all my hair. I had, you know, I'd, I'd love to have sent you a bit. I'll send it to you, but you might, you can look at it personally if you want to put it on your podcast. You can, but um, absolutely. I went, I went in this bloke's book, and um, partway through the book, I, I, there's a video of me winning the Dally M Rookie of the Year in 1983, and um, oh, wow, thick, thick black hair, and I'd never seen it. I'd obviously got the award from Ray Warren and another bloke from the NRL or the ARL, whatever it was back then, back in 83, and um, yeah, it showed me um, Vernon, um, Gray Meady and John Rebo on the wing and scoring a try and all these different moves, and then um, oh, talks about, um, you know, what I what I've done in my career and it's a it's pretty cool. I've never I I'd watched it. I, I was on the show, obviously, and then I'd never seen it because the the week later I played Manly in the eighty three grand final. We won that grand final and that was a massive time for yeah. me, obviously. And absolutely um, winning a few awards. But um yeah, I'll send it to you and you can have a look and see what you think. But um yeah, I'm really proud of starting NASCAR and you know, I get to travel around to a lot of the communities around Australia and um, I'm sort of on a plane every week, more or less now. And, uh, yeah, you know, I really I really love it. But I am getting old and <laughs> I should be <laughs> trying to slow down a little bit. But um, it is what it is. Uh, you got to make the most of every day. You know, that's sort of my theory in life because yeah. you just never know when it's your last, you know, but that's, that's how it rolls, yes. you know. So you're actually uh, recognised for all your work you've done uh, with the Gold Herald Award in 2010 for Aboriginal Health and Education, something like yeah. that. Been been lucky. I've won an OAM. I've been uh, awarded an OAM. That was pretty cool. So that's an Order of Australia. Um, oh, wow. It's pretty pretty decent um, award. Very yeah. very prestigious. And um, and uh, yeah, the Gold Herald was um, again. I sat. I sat on, I'm an ambassador for NDIS, I have been for 10 years, so um, young people with disabilities. Um, okay. The last couple of years I go around and not just open houses for kids 
with disabilities, but support them and try and help them, you know, in, in careers or in life, basically. So I'm really passionate about that. I sat on the board of Are You OK? Australia and Australia here, we've got the highest suicide rates in the world with our mob, you know, and um, yeah. I don't want to be number one at our people taking their lives. So I've been involved with Are You OK? And um, I've been an ambassador for them for a long time. I was on the board for four years. I sat on seven different boards and um, it just got... It just seemed I was in board meetings and every week and it got to the point where I just it was burning me out. So I had to sort of slow down and just um, and take a step back. And um, so I'm still I still like to be an ambassador and do, you know, like I said to you earlier, I've just been made an ambassador for Eels and I really love that job because I still get to catch up with the boys and go and watch a bit of footy, which is good. So, yeah, yeah man. so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty um wrapped in that in that that gig for sure so yeah I'll, i won't step down from that until they kick me off so, yeah. <laughs> good plan good plan i like it yeah. so uh let's rewind the tape a bit let's go all the way back to the beginning where did you grow up and what was life like for you as a young david lydia oh i grew up in uh, out, out in western sydney um the main place is called penrith but i grew up in a little suburb called warrington county and um um um, I've lost my dad nearly two years ago now. He was 87. Um, Mum's 82. She's Aboriginal. My dad was English-Irish, so I've got a bit of English-Irish in me. And um, I got uh, another – I've got two brothers and a sister. Glenn, the youngest, is um, – he played footy as well for the Eels and the Panthers. And um, he's the he's the Aboriginal liaison guy for the Panthers, so he looks after all their Indigenous programs and um, does a great job. He'd be worthwhile having a chat to Dave at some point. He's a yeah. he's a pretty interesting character, my brother, and uh, he's not shy. And uh, he's a very good artist. He does a lot of Aboriginal artwork and um, he does a lot of ceremonies out in community. He gets to go out a fair bit himself. So, yeah, so I grew up in a small town. I My father used to train um, rugby league players. My dad was into fitness in a big way and um, so I used to go out and muck around and try and do what these blokes were doing in my backyard. And um, I started getting into um, fitness magazines and muscle magazines and, you know, I was yeah. obsessed with Arnold Schwarzenegger and all that sort of stuff, you know. So, yeah, so that's that's what sort of got me on the on the journey. Right. So what's, what club did you support, the being around footy all the time as a young fella? Well, I tried. I tried with the Panthers for a long time. When I was younger, I'd go up there and have a trial. I'd score, you know, a few tries. I'd win the ten k fun run. It wasn't fun, but that's what they called it. And um, nothing fun um, about a ten k flat out. Oh, yeah, exactly. So, Brilliant. but I was, I was into, I was into my fitness in a big way when I was younger, and um, obviously because my father and uh, I was just loved it, and um, I thought because I grew up in the Penrith area, I should be a pen panther. And um, I didn't, every time you, in those days, you'd go out and train and play and then you'd go into the dressing room and then your name would be on the board if you were graded. But my name was never there. So I just go back to, I played for Collett and Colts, which is my junior team. And I basically, um, I got a phone call one day from Jack Gibson and Dennis Fitzgerald, Dennis was the CEO of the Parramatta Eels. Okay. And Jack goes, boy, Lydia, bring your boots back, Cumberland Oval at five o'clock. And I went, Nick off. Who's... I thought it was someone playing a practical joke on me, you know. So Jack handed the phone to Dennis and Dennis said, David, is Dennis Fitzgerald from the Parramatta Eels. Um, okay. I went, oh, is that Jack Gibson, <laughs> really? And uh, he said, really? just bring your, bring your boots and be at Cumberland Oval. So I was 19 years old. I lobbed down to Cumberland Oval. I walked in the dressing room. Um, the who's who were playing, you know, like Kenny and Cronin and L, all wow, the right. all the all the guys were there. And I signed a contract, and um, you know, the the rest is history, I suppose. You know, I played under twenty threes, and then I made reserve grade the next year, and then eighty three, I made first grade, and um, that's when it all started to happen. Far out. So. 
You've come into a team that's won back-to-back grand finals, 81-82. You've got the mega star players you've mentioned, like your Ray Price, Sterling, Kenny, Growth, Steve Allen, yep. all of them. You know, what's the thought process for you coming in <laughs> as the new kid on the block, uh, walking into training, and you've got like the best of the best in front of you? Well, you I Jack was a hard but fair coach, and um, we used to do he. He'd make us go away and train on our own and we'd come back and we'd go through, we'd do an eight-lap uh, time trial and I was a pretty good runner back in the days. I could do long distance, but I could. I also got into sprints and I was you know, used to train in this oval and this other bloke that was down there with his son, he ended up making the Olympics. He said to me, he said, you've got great form. I, you know, If I work with you, you could probably run in a hundred and I've in the, in the Olympics. And I went, Oh, well, I'm, I'm going to play footy, you know? And uh, so I was very fortunate. I've always loved my training. I've always been fit and um, I've never had a, never been a big drinker. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never done drugs. And, um, you know, I was, Jack gave me the opportunity to play first grade and um, I was either playing fullback or wing. I watched the highlight reel with Eric Growth a couple of days ago that come up on my Facebook and um, he were playing Bulldogs in a major semi and um, he beat like six players like running yeah. across the field. It was one of the I most – um, Yeah, I was standing there clapping. <laughs> it was just unbelievable and that's what that's what the top team was like. But they weren't big heads, you know. Jack was a, uh, a phenomenal coach and no one ever – answered back to him like you know he he'd, he'd go to Sturlo kick to the seagulls and we'd all be looking at each other going kick to the seagulls what's what's that mean you know like when the seagulls were on the field it meant there was no players there so he he he'd come up with these sort of different terminologies where mm. you'd be going walking back scratching your head going what the hell <laughs> but he was he was unbelievable like just yeah just an amazing. I was very fortunate to um, have a sort of a friendship after he finished coaching us, and um, yeah, it was. Uh, he was a really lovely guy, and um, probably one of the, you know, he was big on the on um, the Green Bay Packers and the NFL. So we used really? to have a a bus, and we sit on a bus, and we'd watch videos of um, of. Uh, of the NFL and we end up going over and watch, watching the Los Angeles Raiders and I was very fortunate to go on to Miami and watch a Super Bowl and okay. um, and Jack Jack was a biggest influence on that for me. Like I would have never have known much about American football until, you know, I played footy with, with Jack and um, okay. he, he, we used to watch it every week on the bus. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Pretty awesome memories. So that first season, you scored 13 tries, like you said, playing wing and fullback. Um, yep. And you were pretty much in the starting side all season. And you picked up the Delhi Rookie of the Year, as we talked about. Like, how good does that feel? You're thinking, holy <laughs> crap, I'm in this team of superstars, and I'm Rookie of the Year. Like, I'm king of the world right now. <laughs> well, it was, yeah, I just got invited to the Delhi M's, not knowing that I was going to get it. Ray Warren, and in this video, I'm going to send you that. They have the. I've never seen it before until I went in this bloke's book called Heroes of Yesterday, and um, they showed me this video, and I've gone, oh my god, I'd never realised that I had bloody good hair back then. <laughs> I was 22 years old, so I was still a like a, not a kid, but um, at 22, you're still trying to get your bearings and stuff, you know. And um, yeah. I was playing with an unbelievable bunch of blokes who had already won two grand finals, and. Um, and that was the difference between what Jack did with the Eels. Like, if you were playing under 23s, you still trained with first grade. If you're playing reserve grade, you still train. We all trained together. And then when we had to do ball work, we split up and go to our, our own ovals and, you know, with our own coaches and do it. I had John Money as the reserve grade coach. And then he took over when Jack left. So it was. The 86 um, final, eh? He won the 86 he, final. The 86, coach. yeah. 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 So, um, cause I, I got an offer to go to Penrith and play under Tim Sheens. They made me twice the money that was, I was getting paid at Para, And I thought, wow, this, you know, 
it's a pretty decent offer. And yeah. Mick Cronin tried to talk me out of it. He said, we'll win another premiership. And I said, Crow, the money's too good. And because yeah. um, and Mick Cronin, apparently, what I'd heard, he never signed a contract. It was always a handshake deal with the Crow. And um, right. he lived in Gerringong, which is a couple of hours' drive from here. So he used to drive up to train and four four days, you know, four times a week and drive back after training. It was, And he's just one of the nicest blokes that you'll ever meet, you know, just such a decent well they all are they're all great blokes so there's not one big head amongst any of them uh, even though they you know won all those premierships and did what they did you know they the whole Parramatta backline except for me played I played city country about four times uh, for yep. city every time I played city I end up getting busted and never played origin that was one of my goals is to play origin obviously yep. and um yes and then play for Australia that's that's the ultimate uh, actually and uh um, but it was never meant to be, and what he, he you know, I'm, I don't cry myself to sleep over it every night. But um, it's yeah. it, it's it would have it's every bloke's dream that if he plays footy to go on and play, you know, for your state and then play play for Australia. And um, those yeah. boys, the, the, nearly the whole backline of the Eels played played Origin for Australia, so it was pretty cool. Yeah, um, to have to play in a side like that, even though I didn't do it, but um, you know, just to be around those blokes and be mates with them is um, pretty pretty awesome. Yeah, man. Um, so speaking of winning, you guys won the grand final in that '83. So you played on the wing, and yep. uh, you know, what's it like going into your first final series? You're a rookie. Like the competition's tough back then. Um, but Mark Graham was actually telling me uh, that. Uh, Parramatta were quite a clean-ish kind of side. They liked to play footy. They weren't always like thugs. Well, so Jack, you guys... Jack didn't like us fighting. Jack was um, he'd um, pull a player off the field if he ever, you know, if, if someone ever started a fight. Jack was very strict in, you know, in the rules of he how he wanted us to play the game, and it was clean. We never, you know, obviously some uh, Ray was a Ray Price is a tough. Ombre, you know, he used to on, bash bro. blokes. <laughs> so, but we had some great forwards, you know. We had a great forward pack who, but we all, um, no one dared to go against what Jack said ever. And um, so we we never ever went out to pick a fight. You know, we had we did have some punch ups at times, but um, yeah. that's just that's just part and parcel of the game, isn't it? You know, it's just um, but. Something that we never really started. That Jack wasn't into that sort of stuff with us, basically. Okay. So, what were your feelings though when you? Because you beat, um, you actually lost to Manly um, in the lead up to the grand final. They beat you nineteen ten, and uh, then you got to the grand final, and it was against Manly again. And yep. uh, so, what are your thoughts? How did Jack Gibson get you guys up for that grand final? And you being a in your first ever final, like how were you guys yeah. going into it? Were you confident? It was um, look those. You know, I just watched the highlight reel of um, Brett Kenny. He took intercepts like he could have been a, a world class baseball player. His hands were like unbelievable, and um, I just seen him intercept some of the most amazing balls that you know, And he he never dropped he never dropped one like it, and. Um, I set him up for his first try, not the first try, the 83 grand final. The ball came out to me. I was going to go into touch. I threw it back inside. It didn't, he didn't catch it, but he picked it up on the bounce and went over and scored. And we just got away. We got away to a good start. And um, yep. Manly had Manly had some great players. Don't get me wrong. They yeah. they, they were a gun side. And um, um, But to win the grand final and... What it was, you know, we we hadn't eaten all day type thing and we stayed in the dressing room celebrating for a bit and we got on the bus to go back to Parramatta Leagues Club but everyone was starving so we stopped at McDonald's on the way back and grabbed some cheeseburgers and, and some drinks and stuff and we walked into the McDonald's and everyone was stopping and looking at us going, oh, my God, you guys just won the grand final. How come you're in here eating McDonald's? But... Uh, it was just cool, you know. Like I, we were, we were lined up at the club, and it was just absolutely 
crackers. And, you know, it's like feeling like um, I've never had this feeling before, but, you know, like a rock star type thing, you know, like um, yeah, people just wanted to get fucked. You know, I don't know about the cameras back then, but um, it was just, you know, signing and autographs and, Yep. Just people wanting to talk to you because we just won a grant, or well, they'd already won an eighty-one and eighty-two, so they'd they'd been yep. through it before. Jack Gibson got up on stage and said, "Ding dong, the witch is dead," or something like that. You know, like his yep. speeches were. That was it. Like that was all he said in that uh, when we'd won the eighty-three and we had the, you know, the all the reporters there getting photos of you and all that sort of stuff. It was like being sort of like a rock star, but not a rock star, yep. so to speak. You know. It's hard, hard to explain. It must have been amazing, like you know. Like, what's that feeling when the the full time whistle goes? I mean, you had some amazing oh. players at Manly. Phil Blake, he he actually tore you guys yeah. to shreds on a couple of yeah. occasions, and uh, he had that He's classic chip over the top, regather yeah. score, and he did it to me. I was playing fullback, and he chipped over my yeah. head as well, and um, regathered and scored like. He was a freak, Phil Blake. There's yeah, no doubt yeah. about it. He could play, and I think he played in England as well. But yes. um, yeah. But uh, I turned to Steve Steve Ello when the siren went. He turned to me and he goes, "Lids, this is going to be a big night, brother." And I went, <laughs> "Okay, I'm ready." So yeah, it was it was surreal, really. Like sitting here now, yeah. forty years on, talking to you about it. It um, yeah. yeah, brings back some pretty cool memories, brother. Yeah, man. Well, you know, when I was 13, so a fair while ago now, 27 <laughs> years ago, I found this video in a secondhand video store of the Winfield Cup highlights from 1982 to 1995, when the Winfield oh. Cup was a thing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, it was the highlights of every single finals match right wow. through all those years. And that's why my knowledge of that era is pretty okay for someone that's yeah, only yeah. born in 84. 13. So, <laughs> like, mate... I just remember seeing these crowds just packed out on the, the hills, these massive flags, oh, streamers all over the field. Like, it was epic, man. Like, that amazing days of rugby. Oh, You're just like running the, across, the winning the grand final, and and Steve Edge was our captain and said, boys, we're going to go and thank the, cra- uh, the the supporters. You know, we're going to go to the hill where they all were. They yeah. were going nuts. Like, it's. Yeah. I know it's it's hard to... I put it into words, but it was like I've been a big fan of Elvis Presley's for a very, you know, obviously he's dead now, and um, but you can imagine what he was going through when he turned up to go on. You know, people were trying to rip his clothes off and all that sort of stuff. But that's what it was like. Like it was, yeah. It was, we just played a game of footy. Not, it wasn't Elvis Presley, but it was. That's what it felt like. You know, like that they wanted a piece of you. Like it was, and that. Yeah. that the Parramatta Eel supporters, they're passionate. I follow, you know, a few different groups online and um, yep. they always go nuts when I, might, you know, say something or make a statement and that, you know. that I was walking out of my apartment a few weeks ago in Sydney and um, this bloke stops and looks at me and I had a, a pair of jeans and a sports coat on. I was going to a meeting and um, he's looking me up and down and I'm checking my fly and I'm going, are you all right, mate? And he goes... You're David Lydia. And I went, yeah. And he goes, oh, mate, I'm a massive Parramatta Eels fan. He said, can we get a photo? And I said, yeah, sure. Takes a photo of me. He told me more about my career than I could remember. And uh, I'm going, wow, you are a fan. He goes, I can't believe I just had a photo with you because I I thought my fly was undone (laughs) because he was just standing there looking at me going, massive Eels fan. But so they they do exist. It's crazy. Getting this ambassador role with the Eels to go back and, to be on stage with um Steve Edge and Steve Eller and Brett Kenny and Eric Groth and yeah. it's pretty cool. It's very cool. Yeah. Yeah, man. Oh mate. I mean, like I say, every podcast I get so nervous before someone comes <laughs> to my place to do it in person or meet them online. I'm just like excited, nervous every single time. But because <laughs> just a big fan, you know, it's pretty amazing for me to it's meet good. people I've looked up to and watched my whole life. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So who who was your last Guy, you did uh, on your podcast. Sorensen of all people. <laughs> so he was a tough. Him and his brother. Yeah, because his brother. They both played for Cronulla, didn't they? They did. Yeah, yeah. He was. They, they were solid 
boys like they didn't muck around those boys. Good Kiwi stock. <laughs> Good Kiwi stock, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah, oh, mate. I, was, I had Mark Graham a, a little while ago. And I, was I just, love Mark. I was shitting Mark's, myself before that one. <laughs> Mark's a, Mark is an absolute legend. Uh, I've caught up. The boys, I live on the Gold Coast at Palm Beach, and they've got a pub down in Kira, and they call it the Figs, the former international greats. And I, yes. I'm, I wasn't one of them, but um, I get invited to go down, and Larry Corrow, who played for Balmain, was... Um, the Black Flash, he's a I've known him for a long time, good bloke. But you know, G- Gary Freeman, the halfback, um, <laughs> all those boys are down there. Um, and they're all really down to earth, humble guys, you know, like they yeah. talk to everybody that want to come up and say hello. And um, you know, I go down with Daryl Williams, and uh, yeah, you know, he. Loves to have about thirty schooners. He does. He's not shy. I'll tinker. But um, but uh, they're they're just an amazing group of blokes who have done, you know, played at that level, and yeah. they're just all down to earth and decent guys. You know, which is pretty cool. Really cool. You know what I like about it is that they still love rugby league. It wasn't just a thing yeah. that came and went. They like still love it to bits. That's what yeah. I like. You know. Yeah, that's cool. I look at the game now um, where they're starting to take blokes off um, for concussions and because yeah. um, I watched the Vegas games because I thought that was pretty interesting and um, and the, the season's kicked off now and some blokes are getting knocked around already and coming off with, you know, back in our day when we were knocked out, they'd give you some smelling salts under your nose and you'd get up and go, oh, and then you'd be on the field. You'd be wandering around going, what the hell's going on? So, but I, I've been diagnosed with a. I had an MRI six months ago. Um, my memory's starting to go on me now, and it might be old age as well. That might have something to do with it. But I know I copped a lot of concussions over the years. Okay. I, Mal Meninga knocked me out one day. Um, He's been. And uh, <laughs> he, uh, I end up getting in the back of an ambulance, going up to hospital, and. The nurses were around me um, looking at me because I thought I was having a baby. And they said, you're going to be very famous if you can have a baby. And um, <laughs> but that's, how, that's, how, that's how unconscious I was. Look, Mel, oh, I spent a couple of nights in hospital um, recovering from that. But, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was um, tough back in those days, but um, it was what it was. And, um, you know, we've, yeah. we've gotten through it. And um, I have got a few injuries to to show from it but um I, I, if I, if someone said would you do it again 100% because um I made a lot of friends and here I am talking to you on, on a podcast yeah. and um you know it's uh it's been an amazing journey so it's been so enjoyable yeah man so speaking of injuries I saw something online that said you were the most injured player of all time because <laughs> you had a stack of injuries through your career mm. What yeah. are some of the best ones you had that you had to play through or that took you out of the game for a while? Well, when I when I rolled my ankle in England, I was playing uh, on, against Leeds and um, I heard my ankle go snap and one foot was facing that way and the other foot was facing that way and I, blokes were throwing up and nearly passing out on the field looking oh. at my how bad my foot was. It was turned the other way around and I'm I'm going, oh, that doesn't look good. And I ended up going in plaster for three months in England. And when I tried to come out, my my asset was my speed. I, you know, used to try and run fast. And I had front rowers running me down. So I thought, oh, this is oh. not good. But um, you know, I've had I've had the ankle reconstruction. I've had I've got two titanium knees going through airports, a pain in the ass. But um oh. I've had I've had seven broken noses, three broken cheekbones, 25 grain worth of teeth, three um yeah, three broken cheekbones, broken this broken shoulder, broken collarbone, five broken ribs, carpal wow. tunnel surgery on both my hands. I've got I've got severe arthritis right through my body, and I went to the doctors this morning, and I might have to have two hip replacements. So yeah, it's been fun. I, I played against a guy called Trevor Gilmeister. I don't know if you he rings a the bell axe. for you. The axe. Well, the axe yeah, axe for me. <laughs> When I, I was playing against Wes and this bloke called Trevor Cogger come through and 
was playing fullback for the Eels and kicked me in the face and knocked all my top front teeth out and two of my bottom teeth. Broke my nose. My nose was sitting over here. And um, well, because um, the crowd burnt down Cumberland Over, we were sharing the Bulldogs ground at Belmore Park. And this is a Belmore. So I got taken off. I was off my head. I'm sitting in the stand with my mum and dad and John Muggleton kicked the ball out and I bounced two seats in front of me and smashed me in the face and broke my nose a second time and blackened my eyes just swollen. I couldn't see out of my eyes and I, my father had to drive my car home. Oh, wow. And um, it was a, and, you know, I've, I've had all my teeth replaced, but I, because I was playing, I only had caps. So for 30 years, I kept them and just kitten get them knocked out, and then I just stopped wearing a mouth guard because I just thought, what the heck? Trevor yeah. Gilmeister hit me, and well, my tongue was out, and I bit through my tongue. I had to hold on to it, and I was hanging on by a skin. So oh, I went God. into the dressing room. Our doctor got me on the table, whacked a big injection in my tongue, stitched my tongue back up, and I went back out and played the rest of the game. So, yeah, you that was <laughs> oh my God. That, that was interesting. That was interesting. I had a That's swollen awesome. tongue. Oh, it's crap. Some of the stuff was just ridiculous back in the in the eighties. So, yeah, yeah. How did you um, recover from that ankle you snapped? Because do you remember Jarrell Yowie for the Broncos? He yeah. caught that bomb. You know, that's what the one injury I can't watch on replay. I just it just makes me cringe because his ankle just snaps. Clean, yeah, you know, ninety degrees, and he never. I know. He never played top grade again. Um, no. Well, yeah. I was. Um, it was a, a painful that, that that finished my career. I was I was at the end of anyway. I was playing in England. I was playing um, the whole KR against Leeds. Um, I tried to come back, and in the end, I couldn't do it. And I just said to my coach, "Listen, I'm done. I'm you know, I, I was nineteen. I was thirty five years old, I think, and." Um, I just thought I'd come home. I had major surgery on it, and I was in a cast for six months, and. Um, and it hasn't given me any grief since, but um, that was the end. That was the one that you know I put the cue in the rack. Then I just thought yeah. my time's yeah. up. I've had a I've had an okay career. You know, it was a pretty long time. I played for the Eels. I played for the Panthers. I played three years at Manly, and I played yeah. four years in England. And um, I was pretty. You know, I got to I got to go and see where my grandfather. Grew up in London in Peckham, and then I went to um, County Cork in Ireland, where my grandmother was from. So I got to travel around the world a little bit, and um, with footy, and you know, spent some time in the group. When I went over to play in England, I just finished with the Eels, and the coach said, "Look, we'll pay for you to go to the Greek Islands for ten days, and you can have a break before the season starts here." And um, so that was pretty cool. I got to do yeah, some really good things. Yeah, very lucky. So because you played in the grand final in your very first season and you've won a grand final, did, was there ever a moment where you fell in that trap that some players probably get caught up in and they think, oh, this is easy, I'll be here again next year and then <laughs> they never make another one or they never even play finals? Like, how, how did that work out? Because 84, you guys didn't you didn't get the chocolates in 84. No, we got beat 6-4 by the Bulldogs. Indeed. Which was a hard pill to swallow because... Going from winning in 83 and then winning Dally M and I won all these other awards as well, which I can't remember, but I know I got stuff in my cupboard that says I did. Yeah. <laughs> and and, um, <laughs> and then and then obviously, you know, it was a different, it was a whole different atmosphere um, losing in 80, 84. And um, yeah. it's, uh, you know, what do you do? You know, like it's you've got to take it on the chin. It was a different atmosphere back at the club. Supporters still came and supported us, which was nice, but yeah. it wasn't like it was in '83 when you know I picked up the Dally M and won all these awards and then won the grand final. It was like r ridiculous. Like it's, it's hard to put it into words what what the feeling felt like, and then the feeling of not winning. You know, but getting yeah. beat six six four was pretty hard pill to swallow for sure. Yeah, you guys were leading at half time, four nil if I'm right. Um, yeah. So yeah. there must have been pretty good optimism at half time that you're going for number four. 
Well, you know, John Money was a protege of Jack and great coach, great bloke. And um and it wasn't his fault. We were out there doing the, you know, doing what we had to do, but obviously it just didn't go our way, you know. So um, Ray Price went and I'm not blaming blaming Ray. I spoke to Raymond this morning. I love Ray. And uh yeah. but he was down yeah. on, on a tackle with um Jeff Bugden's brother Mark, who ended up playing for the Eels at some point in his career. And um he just seen an opening and um got across the line and they kicked the goal and Yeah. And I'm not. I'm not blaming. I'm not throwing Mick Cronin under the bus because I love Mick Cronin. <laughs> but um, obviously, um, I don't know where we scored, but it, it, he didn't kick the goal, and that was um, that was it. You know, it was a different, definitely a different feeling than winning it in '83. That's for sure. So. I bet, mate. I bet. And um, so 1985 rolled around. You played 18 matches. You scored tries in round one and two. Um, and by the end of the season, you're fourth on the ladder. You're going to the finals. You came up against the Panthers and you gave them a hiding and you scored a try. What's it like scoring in a, like a massive match like that? What's the feeling when you put the ball out in such a, a massive big game? I think um, my skill set was to hang around blokes that could get balls away. Mick Cronin was uh, – he didn't – Jack Gibson had a bit of a thing about Mick Cronin. Never, he'd always come off with a clean jersey. I'm not saying Mick – was not a great player because he's one of the uh, he played for Australia, he played Origin, he did it all. And um but he could hold two players off and just get a ball away, you know, like he was yeah. just so I used to time if I was playing fullback or wing, I'd just be hovering around when the crow got the ball. And he just always seemed to get give it to me whether there was a hole and I'd hit it and then obviously I had a bit of speed and I was very lucky, you know. So I'm not taking any bloody credit day for that. I I just had the most amazing group of blokes in that back line that were all superstars, and um, and they're not big heads either. They're really down to earth, normal blokes, yeah. you know, like just just every, every day, sort of. Even though they did it all in the game, they just Jack was Jack just had that thing where he made us all just be normal, you know, it was sort of, it's hard to explain, but um, yeah, he just didn't want blokes walking around with big heads, you know, yeah. He definitely did the trick. So uh, you, you guys went down to the Bulldogs 26 nil um, the next week, which bundled you guys out of the competition. And that's when you went over to Oldham. So how did yeah. that all come about? Because um, that was in the uh, off season for you guys, wasn't it? Yeah. So a bloke who was the coach of Oldham, he was the, I think he was the Great Britain coach. He's passed away now. His name was Frank Myler. He was over there watching me play and um, he approached me after a game and um, said, you know, we'd like you to come and play at Oldham. And um, I was lucky enough to be released to go and play because it was it was the end of the year for us and it was in our off season. So um I still got amazing friendships. I took my sixteen year old brother Glenn with me and I took my mum and dad to give show them what another country was like, you know, and uh yeah. so I had the most amazing time uh, we didn't play a few weeks because the snow was so thick covered the oval and we couldn't play on the on in the snow. We actually I ended up did playing in the snow at when I went to Hull KR. Crazy. I got to the ground and it was absolutely pelting down. And I'm in the grandstand making snowballs, punt pelting the and, and the punters coming in to watch the game and I'm thinking, there's no way in the world we're gonna play in this. And sure enough we get it the coach, um he was the fullback Furburn. Uh, Fairburn, he's a fullback and he, he played for England and ended up coaching Hull KR. We get, they get us in the dressing room and they said, Are you playing? I went, Are you serious? Like, it was like knee deep. And um, I was playing fullback and I was shivering and um, I just didn't want to touch the ball, didn't want to do anything. I'd, but I every time they'd kick it down, I'd have to bloody run the thing back and. <laughs> in the snow and the mud and the cold, and it was minus 22 wind chill factor. I walked off at half time and I was chugging down port and you, normally you have an orange 
oranges and other you know, drinks for for half time break. And I said, look, I'm retiring. I don't want to play anymore. I'm not going back out. And they went, you got you got a contract. You got to go back out. And I went. I ain't going back out. I had hypothermia. I was like this, shaking. Oh I'm, I'm, I'm trying to fight blokes to get into the hot showers, and they're going, you can't have a hot shower. You've got hypothermia. And I'm going, well, well, I can't. So they wouldn't let me. They end up giving me this massive big woolen, a full onesie type thing. And um, yeah. I said, I need to warm up before I go back out there. So they said, okay because I was in, in a bad way. Like I was thinking I've never played anything like it ever, as you can imagine. Yeah. And um, bloody uh, one of the players went down within two minutes of him going back out the field. And I said, you can't be injured. I'm not go I'm not going out. So they said, you've got to go out. Leeds, I've gone, oh, God. So that was – I remember I – you would have remembered Desi Hasler. I played with Desi yeah. for three years at, at Manly, and um, he was playing. He was playing over there as well, and um, okay. he came over, and while I was in asleep, and he knew my car. The cars in England, when you play over there, they take photos and put your photo and the team you're playing for on the car. So okay. he came over when it was snowing and put Vaseline under my door handles, Vaseline on, on my windscreen wipers. So I go out to go to train and, and the car's full of snow. So I put the windscreen wipers on the Vaseline. I've, I've gone, <laughs> the hell? So he was, he was a shocker. He, he, I, got him, I, got, I got him, I got him because it was my birthday and they wanted to take me out for my birthday. Yeah. So we go to this place and, um, and Desi and I were never been drinkers, and I used to train with Des because he was a fitness fanatic as well. And um, yeah, and so when we we're getting drinks, I was putting double vodka shots in his drinks, and um, got him absolutely. His wife rang me the next day and goes, "What did you do to Des?" And I went, "I, I started. I was never into opera, but I'd heard this bloke called Pavarotti sing Ness and Dorma um, oh, the night before, yeah. and I'm walking." Yeah, I'm walking with all the boys like Roy Simmons and James Grant from the from um, Balmain, um, David Hoskins, who was over there playing as well. So we're all catching up, coming out for my birthday. Yeah. And I'm saying, I'm walking with a group saying, I just heard this amazing song, Ness and Dorm, uh, Pavarotti, and Des gets going, who, Pavlova? And I'm going, no, you knucklehead, it's Pavarotti. And he's being an idiot. And so yeah. I thought, oh, I'm going to stitch him up. So every time I went, they went and bought drinks. I went and tipped a double vodka shot in his in his drink. And Christine's wife rang me the next day and goes, Lids, what did you do to Desi? And I said, oh, I probably ate too much pavlova. <laughs> so I went over and gave it to him and he went, you're, you're, I'm going to get you back. I would do your best. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, mate. Some, of the, some of the fun you have when you're with all these blokes is pretty yeah. pretty. Can't tell you too. Obviously, you've got an audience, so I'm not going to go into detail. But yeah, yeah. it was in interesting times, brother. Let me tell you. Oh, yeah. that's so cool. Now, what goes on tour stays on tour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so what was your time like with the Penrith Panthers? Because that, so the, did the Eels release you to go to Oldham? But then, did you then sign with the Panthers when you came back? I did. Yeah. Okay. I left the Eels and um, went went to Penrith under Tim Sheens and. Um, Played with blokes like Greg Alexander and um, Brad Izzard and some pretty decent players. And, um, yeah, they we come close a couple, you know, making the playoffs and stuff, but didn't didn't win the, the grand final. But um, I had a great time with those guys. I went up going back to the Eels for a couple of seasons and John Mooney yeah. took over as coach. And um, I think the Crow, Mick Cronin, come and coached the Eels for a bit as well. But, um, and, um, I had an opportunity in the end. I was my contract was up with the Panthers. I got a big offer from the Bulldogs, and um, Manly made me an offer. Graham Lowe, who you'd know, and um, oh yeah. So yeah, I ended up signing with Manly and um, playing there for three years, and then um, I'd I'd met a, a a really nice girl in Hull, and um, yeah. Um, yeah, so. 
I've got a son in Hull and a grandson now, and um, so that that was one of the reasons I went back and stayed. And then you know the the, the club Hull KR heard that I was in town, and the chairman and the coach come and picked me up and took me for dinner and made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So I stayed a couple of seasons and played there until I broke my ankle badly and thought I'm 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 putting the cue in the rack now. It's all done and dusted. That you know I was not. I thought my time was up, yeah. Yeah, so what about when you went back to Parramatta? Were you excited to go back to your old club? Because you yeah. only got like eight games over two seasons. Like, what was the reason behind that? I had a lot of injuries as well. So okay. I I nearly, I broke, I didn't break my neck, but I was, I played in a city country game and um, yeah. one of the front rows fell on my head and you try and push your, your forehead to your chest and every, everything just popped in the back of my neck and uh, I spent I spent a couple of weeks in hospital and I was in a I was in a brace for a, a very long time and I was a bit nervous about coming back and playing footy I thought my career was over then and um um yeah I I had a lot of injuries so that was the reason I didn't play a lot of footy back then yeah tough, fair enough too so then you went to Manly as you said in 1990 which was Probably a good change for you, I'm guessing, after a couple of tough years. But that's when you yep. meet guys like Matthew Ridge and our man yeah. Darrell Williams, Cliffy Lyons, yep. Jeff Toovey. I'm great mates with those guys. We had a reunion, a manly reunion, just a couple of months ago, and um, I went and caught up with all the boys. Um, you know, the, the Eel supporters gave me a lot of grief because they didn't like Manly, and obviously we beat Manly in the 83 grand final. When I yeah. when I turned up at a reunion for the – for the Sea Eagles, Fatty Borton come up to me and go, what are you doing here? And I've gone, I played for Manly for three years. He goes, yeah, but you beat us in grand finals. And I'm going, so unlucky. So, yeah, I was, I was getting a lot of grief from blokes going, yeah, come your year when you, you know, you played, you beat us in grand finals back in 83 and 82, I think it was. And uh, I went, it is what it is. But uh, they, they were only mucking around. They're... they're it's funny because you they've all got a that sense of humor. Obviously, Fatty was with Sturlow in the Footy Show, and um, yeah, you know, he he Good he was always taking the Mickey out of everybody all the time. So that's yeah. I knew that's what he was doing with me. But um, yeah, you know, I had a great three years under Graham Lowe there, and um, you know, Cliffy Lyons was a freak, and um, yeah. Tony Ira, yeah. Dara Williams, yeah. you know, yeah, they were great players. Yeah, you know, Michael players. O'Connor. Mm. Oh yes, Michael O'Connor. He could kick a goal that boy, and he could score a try. Yeah, right. Yeah. And a champ, champion bloke loves his golf, and uh, it's really down to earth. They're all great blokes, you know. Ridgie, Ridgie was a Ridgie was pretty confident he could kick a goal as well. But um, yes, they're all they've all been at every club I've been to. I've never really fallen out with anyone. They've all been amazing blokes, and uh, and their long life friendships, you know. So who were a couple of players during your career you just loved playing alongside? Like when you look around the changing rooms or, uh, you know, who's the guy that you think, oh, I'm so glad he's on my team and I love playing next to him? The Crow was one of the most down-to-earth um, blokes that you could ever meet. Like I, I rang him a few years ago and um, he's got a pub down in Gerringong. And I rang him and I just said, um, Crow, I just want to, let you know that I've had a mad crush on you for a long time. And he said, keep that to yourself. <laughs> I said, it's nothing, you know, like a, just just the most decent bloke that you could ever meet. Yeah. But they were all, like, it's hard to even s- sort of, you know, they played at every level, the blokes I played with at the Eels. Like Greg Alexander also played at an Australian level in Origin, Brad Izzard, yeah. you know, that. Roy Simmons, they're all champion blokes, and then they're not they're they're not up themselves, you know. Even though they could be if they wanted to be, but they're just all down to earth blokes. That's a tough one to to you know pick, Dave. I I couldn't really pick anyone out, you know. Yeah. Like yeah. I've been very blessed to have the, just just decent blokes and down to earth blokes around me as well. Okay, well I'll make it even harder for you. Who are some of the players you loved playing against? There must be a couple of fellows you just love marking up against. Well, I remember, I remember playing against Balmain. Um, this this Wayne Pierce, um, I took off and I was 
going pretty good. And Wayne Pierce left the ground and hit me around the chest, and it just went like that and yeah. took my wind out. I got up and played the ball like nearly killed me and I went, is that the best you got? <laughs> like, And turned around and run back and I went, oh, my God, <laughs> that nearly killed me. I thought he nearly broke every rib of my body. But oh um, my God. that's what that's what you had to sort of do, put on that sort of, um, yeah. you know, is that the best you got? Like, like people in the crowd, they just went, oh, God, like you could hear it, the smack, like he hit me. Yeah. And Junior, I've done some stuff. Uh, we got picked to do something together, and, and a great guy, like down to earth, done it all in the game, yeah. you know. Um, but that's what they're all like, you know. They're all. I, I don't think I've there's been too many big heads at all, and you know that I've come across that have sort of str- strutted around like you know that there's something special. They've all. Yeah. They're all down to earth, really lovely guys, and Junior was. Yeah, you know, I'll never forget that tackle. Like that yep. makes me feel sick thinking about it now. <laughs> Speaking of Balmain, there was a tackle I remember in probably the early nineties. Uh, Benny Elias. I don't know if you remember it, but he was just out cold. It was a completely legal tackle, but yeah, he yeah. just flew in at him and smoked him. It was great. It's funny because <laughs> I caught up with Benny. I become sort of mates with Benny and um, he's a champion bloke and uh, we had a we were at a function a few weeks ago and he was there and we had some photos together and people were coming up and saying oh it's good to see that you blokes are mates and I said oh how, how can we not be like he's he's a great bloke and great footballer as well like he's did it all in the game but um yeah I can't remember I can't remember that tackle but um yeah I've seen some I've seen some beauties over my yeah how many ever years it's been so yeah i've been very i just feel so blessed to have, you know been called up to go and play for the eels playing those grand finals win a dally a few other yeah. awards um and be able to you know still be remembered by it and i'm being feel really honored to be on your podcast mate so oh, mate. yeah it's you're pretty amazing, famous but... yourself so <laughs> you never know. I'll be looking you up when I come over. I, I took my dad over when he wasn't well, and um, we went to a place that has all these mad um, hot springs. I think I went to Kaitaia with Matthew Ridge because I okay. didn't know. I, I remember because Graham Lowe, we went and played in New Zealand a couple of times with Graham Lowe because he's a Kiwi. Yes. And um, we had like a 1,000 people lined up, and your culture over there is where you do the – Hungy. Yeah, where you touch noses and stuff. Hongi, yeah. What do you call it? It's a hongi. 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 Yeah. Yeah, so we had to we had to rub noses with like 500 people. Like it was <laughs> – and I'm not saying anything rude, but um, some of them would have liked – it would have been nice if they put some under under um, deodorant on or something Very like cool. that. <laughs> <laughs> But I loved it. I loved the culture. We did the, yeah. we went and did the, where they put the things around your ankles and you jump off a friggin' bridge into the water. Yeah. yeah. And because I didn't go into the water the first time, the boys said, you got to do it again. And I went, no, I don't need to. And they went, yeah, you got to do it again. <laughs> so oh. you go into the water. When you're coming back up, your mouth and nose, you're spitting water out of your head. Yeah, I love that. Thanks, guys. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> love New Zealand. I love it, mate. So great, great spot. Did you play in that match against Newcastle in nineteen ninety two at Cardwell Park by any chance for Manly? When I Newcastle would've. won right on the buzzer. It was the first ever premiership match played out of Australia in New Zealand. Oh, maybe not. If it was ninety two, that was my last year at Manly. So I signed with Manly in ninety, ninety one, ninety two. So um yeah. I can't remember. Can't remember. Okay. Sorry. That's all good. <laughs> Daryl Williams scored in that match right before half time. It was a beauty. I definitely <laughs> definitely can't remember that, that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a question from Tahi Rehana. Wants to know who's your favorite neighbor? <laughs> <laughs> Tahi, obviously. <laughs> so, I, he, uh, him and his dog, him and his wife, his gorgeous wife, walk their dog uh, where like, they don't live far from me up in Palm Beach. And, um, what a champion bloke he is. So, yeah, no, I've got to 
I've got to have a shout out to Tahi. He's a he's a he's a legend. He's a champion guy. He's punching so much above his weight, though. But anyway, that's another story. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> um, and the question I asked you earlier from the fan questions was actually from Troy Warner from the Paracave podcast. I'm sure he'd love to give you a shout out and say hello. Um, he I've done one asked, with him. Yeah, good old Troy. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, he, he was the one who asked uh, how important is connectivity between a team as you guys always catch up all the time. Yeah, so I just thought I'd better point that out. Yes. Well, Troy, um, so- Troy, I've done a po- I've done a podcast at Troy's place. I think he's keen for me to come out and do another one, which um, he's out at Penrith as well. So, and he loves the eels, and um, you know, it's 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 just really I feel very honoured to be able to mix with, you know, have this chat with you. Um, I feel really special that you you've had some amazing legends on, and I don't feel like I'm anywhere near that level, but um just to be able to play in a team or the teams I've played with and, and kept these friendships and it's opened doors for me and um, helped me with my not-for-profit and given me a, a bit of a name, you know, like people yeah. still, even though I'm bald now and um, old, I'm still being asked to be an ambassador for the Eels, which I'm so proud of. And, um, you know, I get to go to Darwin for four days when they play the Dolphins up there. And, um, oh, nice. You know, I was watching the Dolphins play the other night and that fullback for the Dolphins. Um, Good, isn't he? <laughs> scored three tries. Friggin' hell. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, I just, I just look at the boys at, at the pace they play now and what it's like and um, hopefully – They've got good insurance. <laughs> well, I'll tell yeah. you what, um, you might not think, you know, like I, I've had this from a few people I've approached to come on the podcast and they say, oh, oh no, I wasn't anybody in rugby league. And I'm like, well, I've heard of you. I'm just a fan. I never played. You laced up the boots. You, you won a grand final with one of the greatest teams of all time. So you know, don't underrate yourself, mate. When you, when you put it like that, it sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Really? Pretty uh, amazing, you know. And, and you know what, um, as a fan of the game, and like, I'm a fan of the game, <laughs> I yeah. love the game, but rugby league is something that brings people together and it's something to get mm. passionate about and look forward to at the end of the working week. And, you know, without the amazing players that play, like we've got, what else is there to do? I mean, what, what are normal people have doing? You, on the have, you, have you seen, <laughs> obviously Vegas looks very um, tempting now to, they want to sign the next five years to play in Vegas, which is unbelievable. And yeah. then um, the Panthers-Eels game, full out, full stadium, like shot every – so where the Dolphins played, whoever they played yesterday, um, sold out stadiums. Like people uh, can't wait to get back to the footy now. Like it's, it's unbelievable, yeah. like – you know, which is fantastic, which is great to see. So, yeah, I feel very honoured, brother, for you to pick me to be on your podcast because I know you've had some amazing legends that I just look up to and think, wow, you, how, how lucky, you know, to have interviewed some of these great guys that have um, played the game. So, yeah. Well, I just, I just thank you so much for coming on and, you know, you know, giving me a chance to chat to you because not everyone says yes. Let's put it that way. <laughs> wow. Well, I feel very honoured and um, I feel very honoured that you asked me, mate. So, oh, it's Dave, fantastic. it's been a pleasure. When I come to New Zealand, I'll get Reggie in a headlock, Tony Iro. You don't know. I don't. You know, no need to force him. But we'll come and um, I'll have a Canadian. I've just started doing a Canadian club, brother. So I'm like, I'll Beautiful. shout you a couple of Canadian clubs. Sounds perfect. Right, we'll finish with a few fun questions. I like to ask all my guests, and that is, who's going to win the NRL in 2024? And you've got to be objective. <laughs> <laughs> well, I played the three clubs in uh, in Australia, Para, Pen, Penrith and Manly. And um, I think uh, even though, you know, the Eels went down to the Panthers, and um, they've had, I think they're on a three-peat, um, I was, I'm mates with Ivan Cleary. Um, my brother works for the Panthers. But I'd like to see Para win it. I'd like to see yeah. them go out. Um, so I'm going to say Para. Um, Fair enough. And Penrith will they'll play Penrith in the grand final, hopefully. 
Oh, a big rematch from a couple of years ago. It'd be pretty cool. Yeah. It'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what's your favorite TV show of all time? Oh, mate, I'm a massive Elvis Presley fan. So anything that Elvis played in, I, I love. But um, nice. my favorite TV show, oh, God. Um, I'm into maths at the moment, the Married at First Sight. <laughs> Me and the missus watch that too. <laughs> so I'm not on my own. So yeah. Good trash oh, TV a, at the end of the day. There it is. <laughs> that's it, brother. That's it. I love it. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. First person to say maths. I'm so happy. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question. If you were on death row, what would your yeah. final meal be? <laughs> oh, I love lobster. It'd have to be lobster yeah. mornay. Yeah. I'm a five star black fella, mate. My my tribe is a Versace tribe, you know. I'd i you know I'd, I'd if I could eat lobster and steak, that's that's me. I'd love it. So I'm a seafood man, so yeah. Yeah. Prawns and lobster. So I'd have to say lobster. Brilliant, brilliant, man. Oh, I love it. Well, thank you so <laughs> much for coming on the Point of Difference Rugby League podcast and going back in the day with me. It's been an absolute privilege to speak to you. Uh absolutely, you know. You're amazing, mate. Um, and I love it. Elected, you, you know, look forward to catching up when I come to New Zealand. I've got your details, so I'll give you. I'll let you know when we're on our way, and we'll go and have a nice dinner somewhere, mate. Sounds perfect to me, man. And uh, thank you to everyone out there for watching on YouTube and listening on Spotify. Um, this has been the amazing David Lydian, and we'll see you guys next time for kickoff. Thanks, Dave. Full time.